My, uh, I'm Virginia Bliss Birkeland, and I graduated from UMB in 1951 with a BA. Uh, back in the days when there were 90 co-eds only and 1,400 students. Uh, of course, uh, graduating in 1951 uh, uh, meant that Lord Beaverbrook was the chancellor, and he capped us, and there were only 150 graduates that year, uh, arts and science, because uh, forestry and engineering uh, went on to five years that year. So 150 of us paraded in front of Lord Beaverbrook, um, sitting in a rather high, large chair in the gym, um, raised on a platform. Um, as we walked by, holding our mortarboards in our hands, uh, we knelt in front of him on a cushion, which was um, at least one step below him. And um, I'm, uh, I'm sure he enjoyed the sort of symbolism of putting, <coughs> of putting our mortarboards on us, he in a seated position and we kneeling at his feet. I'm sure he loved that. Being a rather short man, in my experience, short men very, like, uh, very much like to be, uh, feel that they're taller than other people. And he was taller than all of us, even the gigantic boys of six foot three. Uh, but what I really want to talk about is um, my experiences with Lord Beaverbrook in England. I graduated in 51, but I, I moved to England in, um, in the fall of that year and married an Englishman at Christmas time. Uh, he was a schoolmaster and had taught Latin uh, at UMB. And <coughs> uh, by 1960, my husband had become the headmaster of a boys' school, St. John's School in Leatherhead, Surrey. Um, it was a school of about 400 boys, boarding school, public school as it's called there. And uh, uh, of course, Lord Beaverbrook lived at Micklem, uh, Turkey Court at Micklem, which was sort of uh, a ten minute drive away, really. Uh, so by 1961, I was very used to entertaining uh, people of note, one sort and another. And um, so I thought, well, Beaverbrook's a, country, a countryman of mine, and he did cap me, and I had a chat with him. So I think um, I'll ask him to dinner. So I wrote to him and asked him if he'd like to come to dinner. And I had a note back from his secretary saying, his lordship thanked me for the invitation, but uh, uh, he was unable to come to dinner. But would my husband and I come to lunch? So this was sort of in June of 61. And um, uh, so I said, yes, we'd come to lunch. So we did. It was sort of the middle of June, a beautiful sunny day. So we drove along this huge, very, very long um, uh, uh, driveway up to Beaverbrook's place. Uh, which was gigantic, and um, <clears throat> um, I knew very quickly why uh, his lordship uh, declined the invitation to dinner. He had gout in a big way. He was wearing bedroom slippers. And uh, <clears throat> there was another person there. Uh, she didn't seem to be either a guest or the hostess. It was, it was uh, we were introduced to um, Lady Dunn. And, um, in fact, it turned out later, I discovered that they were secretly married at that time, but it hadn't been announced, and I assume it was because the uh, arrangements for financial uh, whatever had not been completed. I, I don't know. I can't think why, why else. But she, uh, she was rather an extraordinary person in appearance. She had iron gray hair, and it was... Uh, Normally in those days, if you had iron gray hair, you had it up, long iron gray hair. Hers was down to her shoulder, so she, she did, I'm afraid, resemble a witch. But um, I, uh, <coughs> um, she joined in the conversation up to a point. But of course, Beaverbrook dominated everything. And <coughs> I can't remember whether it was when we were having drinks before lunch or whether we were having, when we were having coffee afterwards. But it was a lovely day, and we were out on a patio, a sort of wooden wooden patio. He was raised up off the ground because with gout he wouldn't be on the grass. But he had a ticker tape machine out there and it was during the Canadian elections and uh, every now and then, of course he had his foot up 
uh, you know, on a stool. It was, I, I would think it was her th probably throbbing. But anyway, every now and then he pulled out a tape from the ticker tape machine to see what was happening in the Canadian elections. And <clears throat> he, although he um, lived in England a long time, I think really his heart was always in Canada. And I think that was probably the reason that he, uh, you know, he, he didn't want to sort of give up his Canadian connections uh, uh, that we've all heard about uh, recently. Now, <clears throat> all right, so we were, we were uh, seated at the dining table, uh, Beaverbrook at the end, uh, uh, Lady, uh, well, Lady Beaver, Lady Don um, on one side, and uh, I was sitting on the other side. I can't remember where my husband was sitting. Perhaps he was next to me. Um, so we had a th delicious, we had some lovely white wine, and it was a Friday probably, so we had fish and some sort of potatoes and, and truckle, which is what the, uh, the uh, Scottish people call new carrots, which have to be uh, scraped by hand by some little tweeny in the kitchen. But they were sweet and lovely. And... Um, uh, we, uh, we were just having sort of usual kind of conversation at lunch, and uh, he said, um, I more or less finished my uh, my plate, and he said, "Would you like um, Would you like anything more?" And uh, I said, "Well, Lord Beaverbrook, I really like some more of those carrots." So he bellowed out, "More carrots, Lightfoot!" And the footman uh, or the butler, uh, who was sort of loitering behind behind me, brought me a a, a good helping of carrots. Um, now, whether it was the white wine, or whether it was the carrots, or whether it was just the general uh, uh, relaxed feeling, uh, uh, I thought I was emboldened to ask uh, Lord Beaverbrook a question, which I'd often wondered. My mother was living in London at the time, and she'd come over uh, from Canada, and she used to buy the Express, the Daily Express every day, because she said there was it was the only paper that had any Canadian news in it, <clears throat> but it was full of gossip. So I said, Lord Beaverbrook, I'd really like to know why uh, you put so much gossip in your paper. He said, I'm a businessman. I'm a businessman. I give the people what they want. I give them gossip, and I sell more papers. That was it. So I thanked him and said, well, that explains it. Then. And we had quite a, a sort of open, uh, frank uh, a talk about things. You know, um, I wasn't going to talk about the weather with such a marvelous opportunity. So he, he anyway, it was, it was an interesting experience. And not only uh, the conversation, but um, uh, the other thing that was interesting about it was, it was his drawing room, which was covered. I mean, the picture frames more almost touched one another. There were, were a lot of Munnings. Now, Munnings, as you probably know, uh, uh, painted horses. He had a wonderful collection of Munnings. He had uh, uh, Reynolds and, you know, a lot of the greats. They were just, you didn't quite know what to look at because you wanted to see it all. And uh, it was uh, it was lovely. Anyway, um, uh, he, he was dead, I think, in 63, I think he died, something like that. So he didn't last much beyond that. But he, he was a remarkable man. But of course, he, he looked, he, he, um, he um, being very short, um, and, uh, and of course, very well tanned, because, you know, he followed the sun up to a point, uh, and very, uh, had a lot of um, liver, liver spots on his forehead and so on. So he, he immediately looked like a kind of man of the world. You know, he obviously wasn't uh, sitting in his uh, uh, office all his life. But <coughs> um, uh, I have friends in Leatherhead, and whenever, when I go to England every year, I, I visit them. And about three years ago, uh, Cherkley uh, had been um, uh, open to the public. Uh, so my friend said, oh, uh, let's go for tea. There's a tea room there. So. Uh, when the hearings were taking place in Fredericton, I went to some of them and met uh, um, a Mr. Marshall, who uh, had who was sort of in charge uh, of Cherkley when it was being uh, uh, renovated, and also uh, he was for 25 years he was uh, Beaverbrook's kind of uh, uh, secretary, uh, kind of right hand man in the Beaverbrook um, what's it called the Beaverbrook. Uh, Association. It was not called the association, but the I've forgotten what it's called in in England, and uh, <clears throat> so he knew Beaverbrook back to 
front. So after the uh, after he gave evidence here, I went up and chatted with him and said, you know, I had lived at St. John's School in Leatherhead, and oh, he said, it's fine school still, fine school. And uh, I said, do you live right in Leatherhead? He, uh, he said, yes, I do. He said, uh, uh, and I'm, of course, I'm at church every day. I said, well, I go over every year. He said, oh, come and, come and see us. Come and see me, and I'll show you around if it's not open. So uh, the day I went with my friends for tea, uh, uh, I went, and when I got the ticket to go into the grounds, uh, I said, is Mr. Marshall available? And the ticket uh, seller said, oh, I'm so sorry. He retired yesterday. So I didn't see inside, but my friends and I wandered around the gardens, and they had uh, just been uh, restored that um, that year, and there were lots of um, uh, spaces between the plants, uh, as any gardener would 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 leave uh, for the plants to the perennials to uh, to uh, uh, to grow. And, but it was quite marvelous. The color scheme was simply fabulous. And the planning was so symmetrical, you know, on either side of a, a stairway outside, there would be, you know, a, a huge urn of flowers. There would be kind of 12 blossoms uh, in that urn. And on the other side, there would be another urn also with 12 blossoms. It was fabulous. Anyway, it's being sold now. Uh, and I had a, um, uh, a note from my friend saying it was up for sale. They, they, they obviously couldn't extract enough money from various sources to pay for, for the renovations. Yes, um, uh, <coughs> the Carolyn in the um, uh, Lane Beaverbrook residence, of course, uh, didn't normally play, but you always knew when Beaverbrook was around because the Jones Boys was played on the, um, on the Carolyn. And I don't know why they didn't play it more often. Maybe it used a lot of electricity or something like that. I don't know. Um, um, he, um, uh, I know that when he, um, uh, now Somerville House, he, he was actually built. It was originally called Summer Villa, and it was built by uh, an ancestor of mine. And uh, <coughs> uh, uh, he. Uh, uh, before he bought that, he was um, driving with uh, his uh, chauffeur, I suppose, um, down in the uh, sort of Lincoln area, and he saw Belmont. It was before the airport was there, and he, um, uh, he because um, his place uh, in England had trees, a tree-lined avenue going up to his house, uh, Belmont had a tree-lined avenue. And he was very impressed by that. And he said to his uh, assistant or secretary, that's the house I want to buy in Fredericton. And as it turns out, one of my bliss uh, ancestors had built that one too. And uh, <coughs> so uh, uh, when he came back, the airport was being built. And of course, they cut down the trees. And he drove by and he said, oh, no, I'm not interested in that anymore which is such a pity because the Belmont's really going downhill, lovely big boards, uh, uh, pine boards on the floor, and you know, really, really, really attractive uh, house. And he would have uh, maintained it and everything. It was such a pity. But <coughs> Beaverbrook had, um, uh, he had an aura uh, that Fredericktonians weren't familiar, well, they were familiar with in a way because the founding fathers and all that sort of thing. And Canadians in Fredericton quite sort of Still, it was very kind of United Empire loyalist, British, and so on. And <coughs> there was uh, a, a, pride <coughs> a pride in um, people's uh, connection with, with uh, 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 well-known figures. And <coughs> people had a very high opinion of Beaverbrook on the whole. You know, uh, it was before, uh, you know, the sort of uh, less savory things came out about him. But, um, he did a lot for Fredericks and, and certainly for UMB, and probably um, uh, probably laid foundations which w we're still reaping, I think, in, in the reputation. I think that's good. Is there anything <coughs> else that you were just dying to say? Well, there is one thing that I didn't mention, at least I don't think I mentioned, and that was <coughs> 
When I graduated, a friend of mine was the valedictorian, uh, Alder Giroux. He was brilliant. Uh, he didn't study, and he always got better marks than I did, which annoyed me enormously. But anyway, he was a good friend, and <coughs> he was the valedictorian of our high school class as well. Anyway, he gave a really good valedictory in the, in the gym. And Beaverbrook was obviously impressed. And Beaverbrook went up to him afterwards, or probably vice versa, I'm not sure, and <coughs> congratulated him and offered him on the spot a job with the Daily Express as a reporter. Now, Alder had been working for weeks on this uh, valedictory. And he was sensible enough to know that uh, uh, journalists um, uh, spend about two hours writing long, uh, one long column. And uh, it has to be ready in the morning. And uh, he knew he wouldn't be up to that. And um, so I was really quite impressed by him. At 21, he, he refused the offer of a job to work on the uh, uh, Express. He wouldn't have lasted anyway. And he, he wouldn't have put up with what one had to put up with as a junior uh, journalist on the Express in those days.